trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord We're singing yes Lord, yes Lord, yes, yes Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure. And His joy is going to be my strength Though the sorrow may last for the night The joy comes with the morning I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord We're singing yes Lord, yes Lord, yes, yes Lord Yes Lord, yes Lord, yes, yes Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Nice. Amen. 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 Good morning, beautiful people. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. No, wait, 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 wait. And I say you are beautiful people. Because. because you are God's people. Welcome to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church on this fifth Sunday in Lent. We will be spending our time today talking about God's restorative power, even over dry bones. So please take a moment to look over the little information sheet that's there on your table um, and um, make some plans to, to be a part of the great things that are happening at our church. You know, next Sunday is Palm and Passion Sunday, which walks us into Holy Week. And I hope that you will particularly make an effort to attend the services throughout the week, um, from Palm Sunday to Holy Thursday to, um, and Holy Thursday is when we have our, uh, our famous, or infamous, no, famous Last Supper drama um, returning to the stage, and um, that'll be up in the sanctuary, and then our sunrise service on Easter morning, and on Easter Sunday we will have a combined, amazing combined service at 11 o'clock. Um, so all of these services will be filled with, with very meaningful moments and music that have been planned for a very long time. And you will want to experience the entire week as one of the most important times in our Christian journey. You know, the services in that upcoming week are meant to be taken as a whole. Um, I know it's very tempting to jump from the celebration of Palm Sunday to the celebration of Easter Sunday, but I hope you will remember what I always tell you, you can't get to the resurrection without journeying to the cross. And so Holy Thursday creates that necessary bridge for us. Also, please look for um, details about our spring flea and our fish fry. Um, and I'm sure that you'll be getting emails about those during the week. And please be sure to volunteer to help with those as we need lots of willing workers. Um, and speaking of volunteers, we have a group here at St. Andrews who work tirelessly to provide for others. And the group that I'm focusing on today is our Bless This Child program. Now you'll see Jim and Claude, not at your table yet, but you'll see at your table is a, a little packet. You see that little <coughs> packet in a Ziploc bag? That is a, an outfit for a child that has been created by the people of this church. 
Um, to date, over 7,000 pieces of clothing have been sewn and shipped to children in need all around the world. And since we have a new shipment ready to go, I'd like for us to take just a moment and pray over these outfits. Now, is this not the cutest thing you've ever seen? This, I love this one because I picked out the material to go with it. So, and then Nancy Cope made this one just, just, just with, with my fabric in mind. So, um, Jim, could you come and hold on to this one? And I'd like for those, let me get back to Mike. Got it? What I'd like for you to do is to each reach out a hand and touch that little outfit in that bag. Can you, can you all get to one? If you're able to do that, yep. And let's pray over, over these together. Holy God, you are the one who clothes us and provides us with all that we need. So thank you for those who have dedicated themselves to the Bless This Child effort and, and for all the differences that they're making in the lives of children. So many of the children who will receive these outfits just don't have opportunities to receive new clothes. And so we ask that you bless the program and especially bless each child who will wear each piece. May their lives be made just a little brighter and healthier by the work of our St. Andrew's friends. And just as you've clothed each of us in your righteousness and love, may the wearer of these clothes be equally clothed in your grace. Amen. So as some of you come up for communion later in the service, I'd ask that you just place those back in this bag over here to the side of the stage so that I can get them back to where they belong. And now as we turn to our time of worship, I say to you, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Will you turn and share that peace with one another? <laughs> Jeff, you're in good voice to have a cold. I I don't I don't know why, but you know it's I do. just. Elaine, <laughs> that's that's cute. I like it. All right, let's do this. I got okay. a lot to say today. <laughs> that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory that your hand would be with me and you would keep my heart from evil Amen Lord that you Bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and you would keep my heart from evil. Bless me. 
I just want to keep singing and then go home. Um, as we turn to our time of praying together, do you have folks that you would name so that we might all remember them together? I would um, say to you, Marla is in the house. And Artis, Artis is in the house. That's good stuff right there. Is there anyone else you'd like to name? Thank you. Well, alrighty then. I know you have others who are on your hearts, but will you pray with me now? Holy God, your breath alone brings life to dry bones and weary souls. You know our faults, and yet you still promise to forgive. We ask you now to forgive us when we act like dried up people. Breathe into our bones the ability to move in rhythm with you. Pour out your spirit on us that we may face despair and death with the hope of resurrection and faith through Christ our Lord. Help us to dance in the spirit, the breath of life, which calls us out of the valley of dry bones and into the kingdom of God, both a present reality and the grounding of our future hope. In this life, may we be the body of Christ. Help our hands to hold the sick and the suffering. Help our feet to walk to the poor. Help our ears to listen to those who live in despair. May our eyes be fixed on the suffering of the cross and the hope of the empty tomb so that we may live as resurrection people. We especially ask that on this day you would be with those who are in a need of fresh, a fresh breath of hope and strength for whatever reason or circumstance. We lift up to you those who are sick or hospitalized, those who are quarantined or locked down in some way, those who are on the front lines of defense and care. 
We also pray for a breath of compassion upon those who grieve. Breath of God, Holy Spirit, fill our lungs with your love and, and stir within us the ability to follow you into the world as we care for one another. And may the prayer Jesus taught us form us all along the way as we travel together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Ezekiel 37 verses 1 through 14 give, these verses give us the details of Ezekiel's vision where God shows him the valley of dry bones and commands life to return. The hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them, and there were many living in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. <sighs> it's a deep, heavy scripture, isn't it? I'm going to take it just a moment and turn to Paul, also a deep writer. And in his letter to the church in Rome, Paul affirms the people's change of heart once they commit themselves to God's will. And we'll read chapter 8, verses 5 or 6. Through 11. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You're in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit who dwells in you. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we've spent the past few weeks kind of looking at, at our needs. The first Sunday in Lent helped us to, to better understand that temptations may draw us away from the will of God. And in the second week, we heard Nicodemus 
And through his struggle to understand who Jesus is, we kind of discovered our need for rebirth. And, and we visited with the woman at the well in our third week. Do you remember any of these stories? Yeah. And we noticed our personal thirst for living water. And, and then last week, we explored last week's scripture. And we, we encountered the blind man and, and perhaps recognized our own blindness and our own need to see that we have been cleansed and we are now sent. Do you remember the pool called Siloam, the pool called Sent? Um, to be witnesses to the light. And, and these texts um, all throughout Lent draw us into a, a deeper, deeper understanding of our human needs and God's divine provisions for us in those needs. Now, we didn't read the gospel lesson um, prescribed for us today, but it's the story of Jesus' friend, Lazarus, who died. Remember Lazarus who died? Some of you know this story. Um, Lazarus, who that's Mary and Martha's brother, and many of you will know that tale, and I hope that you'll take some time to reread it this afternoon or, or sometime this week. But, but okay, here's, here's kind of the crux of the story. Um, friend Lazarus, Jesus' friend Lazarus, he dies, and he's been in the tomb, he's been in the grave for four days behind the stone, and Martha and Mary are devastated. They do not understand why Jesus didn't come in time to save their brother's life. And, and Jesus says that it happened this way so that God could be glorified. And he tells them to open up the sealed tomb. And then he calls out to Lazarus, who, who gets up and walks out of his grave alive and well. It's an amazing story. And Jesus sort of says, well, don't just stand there and wrap him from his grave clothes. Um, you know, and Lazarus goes on to enjoy life with his family. And so that's kind of the Reader's Digest Convinced version of the story. And again, I encourage you to go back and read all the details because it's just fascinating. Um, you'll remember that the writer, John, in his gospel, has, has just drawn us into a deeper understanding of our human needs in the story of the blind man. And now in this following story, when Jesus comes and raises Lazarus up from being dead after four days, you know, at this point, John's gospel moves us more intently into our needs and actually introduces us to our own mortality and focuses our gaze on God's saving grace. Now, the, the raising of Lazarus from the dead shows continuing life, just as Jesus' own death and resurrection leads us to eternal life. You know, in his conversation with, oh, I get the sisters mixed up. I think he was talking to Martha at this point. Martha or Mary, <coughs> he makes clear that not only will Lazarus live after death, but also us, those who believe in him. And he assures the sisters and us, saying, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. That's some pretty serious reassurance right there, isn't it? And it, this is the same theme that's woven into the text of Ezekiel's vision. And both readings call for our Christian response to God's grace as we are drawn toward a, a reconciled relationship with God. You know what? At this point in the Christian year, the Christian calendar year during this Lenten season, we're, we're kind of eager to see the scripture through the lens of the cross. You know, as if we're, we're looking back and we've already moved past that point of examining Jesus' suffering and, and passion. And in this season of our lives of, of kind of unrest and uncertainty, can you imagine the uncertainty and unrest you would feel this morning if you lived in Mississippi? Yeah. Um, you know, in this season, we kind of long for that hope that comes after all the crucifixion stuff. You know, with all the information that we're getting that, uh, that only feeds our doubt and our insecurity, we want happy. You know, we want comfort. And with Holy Week and Easter approaching so rapidly, we're kind of tempted to leap forward toward the resurrection. It's going to take some great restraint in those urges um, for us to just kind of plant ourselves firmly, ourselves firmly in this Lenten season right here at the end. We have to be you have to be really intentional right now to face the things that separate us from God. Our temptations, our, our struggling, our, our thirsting, our blindness, and our very death. 
know, really intentional to prepare our hearts to return to God, really intentional and firmly grounded in this season of preparation when we, when we turn and face the physical raising of Lazarus and we look back on the spiritual visioning of the Ezekiel package, pa passage. You know, right now we're seeking a, a better understanding of the new life that's made available to Israel and continues to give us hope today. Now, looking at Ezekiel, it, it's in that very first verse of chapter 37 that we just read that the prophet, Ezekiel himself, experiences the hand of the Lord leading him in a very powerful way. See, Ezekiel is a Hebrew. He is a Hebrew who has been captured by Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that name? He's the king. Yep. And, and his tribe as, as, uh, of Levi, as well as the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, they've all been seized. They're all in captivity. Now, remember, we're only talking about the 10 tribes of northern, um, the 10 northern tribes here. Okay. The two southern tribes are down in Judah, and, and they're there with their capital of Jerusalem and, and the temple. Um, the, the 10 tribes of Israel, that's north of Judah, they're, all, they're kind of scattered to the wind. They, uh, there's so much going on there. They're all over the surrounding nations, and, and it's looking as if they're never going to be joined together again and return to their promised land, joined together as one people. So the exiled people, they've been exiled from their place because Nebuchadnezzar has come in and taken over, lots of war and stuff going on, and they've been scattered to the winds um, and all this upheaval. It's like a tornado came in and destroyed the city. Does that sound familiar this morning? Yeah. And so the exiled people of Israel have lost their hope in the future. And they cry out that their bones, their very bones are dried up. Hope is lost. They actually use those words in verse 11. Hope is lost. They had hoped that Jerusalem would be their forever home. But they had found that to be a false hope as they're exiled from their land and, and their identity and their destiny as God's chosen people, as a nation, seems to them to be lost forever. In Ezekiel's vision, the prophet is shown a valley of bones. And he's asked whether the brokenness before him, all this brokenness in this valley, can live. And the prophet replies, you know, God alone knows. Only God knows. Oh, Lord, you know. Now, not long ago, I meant to bring it, I forgot to bring it. Um, not long ago, I was putting all my nativities away. You know, I have a couple of nativities that I put in my office. If you're able to go up there, I think we counted 113 at the, at the very end. But So I had a few nativities in my office, and I, I was putting them away. I did not break one single piece this year. But as I was putting the boxes um, back in my office and putting the books back on the shelves, I dropped my clay patent. Yeah, as a patent is the little dish that you serve communion on you know so you have the chalice and the paten so I broke my plate and now that it's broken you know I might have an idea if if I can somewhat glue things into something that resembles a plate I can kind of have an idea of that but I'm no authority on broken clay things so the potter who made it he's the expert he's the best one to decide if it can be completely repaired and restored to its original beauty and intent so can the bones and the brokenness live? And Ezekiel answers really well. He says, God alone knows. Only the creator knows. So Ezekiel's then instructed to prophesy to the bones before him. And he witnesses the bones being covered in flesh. Ew. Can you imagine what this is like? Um, and, and he's instructed to prophesy again. And the spirit of life is breathed into those bones. And as I was reading and studying, I realized that this imagery is really hard to miss. This is Israel. Actually says it's Israel. You know, and this is, this is the tribes of God's people. Like the dry bones that are scattered all over the valley. This is God's church scattered all over the place. Not only physically, but spiritually. They've been taken from their promised home and, and from their promised land and away from their hope. Just like Ezekiel's vision of physical death, God's people are spiritually dead at this point. Can Israel escape this death and live again? Is, is, this, is this coming up out of the graves? Is this a metaphor for the restoration of Israel? And in my studies, I, I noted that for Jews today, this chapter of Ezekiel is one of the traditional readings over Passover. 
during Passover. This is a traditional prophetical reading for the Sabbath during Passover. Probably because being brought out of Egypt, you know, out of their spiritual death was a sort of resurrection for them. The people of Israel are free to live again. Now, perhaps the life that enters these dry bones indicates that new life is being offered by, um, by God to God's people. You know, they are being rescued from a dead past. Um, maybe, maybe being again placed on their own soil suggests that they're being returned to the way of life that was God's original intention. So in both the Ezekiel story and the Lazarus story, it's pretty obvious that death has occurred. You know, Lazarus has been in the tomb for days. His sister kind of balks at the notion of removing that stone and opening the grave. And, and she says, she says in the, in, the, in, the, in the translation that we read, in the version that we read, it, it says, Lord, he's been in there four days. He's going to smell. That's what it says in our translation. In the King James Version, it said, he stinketh. Yep. For Ezekiel, the valley is full of dry bones and not, not heaped up bones in a great pile, but strewn out bones as if some great battle has occurred and the remains of the dead have been left to be ravaged or to rot. These images are anything but pleasant. And the resulting understanding is that death has obviously occurred. It's not meant to be pleasant. Our own impending death may not be quite as obvious. You know, we tend to look for the physical signs of, of decline or de decay. And maybe we have in mind a, a bloody battle that strips us of our humanity. You know, that kind of battle. But, but today's reading from Romans, from Paul, reminds us to set our minds on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. We acknowledge that by being brought into the body of Christ. We are given new life. You know, through the work of the spirit of God, we experience victory over death in our own lives. Victory over both physical death and spiritual death. That's where our hope comes from. From where our hope comes, said the English major. Um, we cannot act for ourselves, but we can turn to God for action. You know, we see, we see hope as God in Christ um, at, at, at Lazarus' tomb, and Lazarus is called to life. We see Lazarus emerge from the tomb, still in his grave clothes, um, but truly dead, but brought up alive so that we may believe in the power of God Almighty. You know, we experience hope in the valley of bones as the Spirit of God acts on these bones. Flesh and tendons and muscles form and life is breathed into the dead, the truly dead, but brought up alive so that we may believe in the power of God Almighty. Even those of us who have been dead a really long time, when we become a part of the body of Christ, when we accept Jesus into our hearts and promise to live in a renewed way, that's when we hear God call for breath. And our hearts are changed. And the Spirit brings new life. This is from where our hope comes. From the new life that God makes available to us through Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and in this hope, the most, the most important thing for us to remember is that no matter who we are or where we come from or what we've done, this new life through Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit is available to every single one of us. Every single one. Regardless of what we look like or who our parents were or even if we have hearts that have been dead. Regardless of anything. You know, but... By looking at a bone, you can't tell what kind of a person that was, what kind of person that bone belonged to, can you? Yeah? Was it a good business person? Maybe. I don't know. It's a bone. You know, was it a hardworking person? Maybe. Was it a Christian? I don't know. Maybe. Was it a person who looks just like you? Maybe. Maybe not. You know, what we do for a living or how we live or even what color our skin is really has nothing to do with the reality that God is available to bring life to every single one of us, every one. That's the wonder and the glory and the mystery of who God is. That regardless of who we are, God loves us enough to offer us life, everlasting life. I love that phrase, everlasting. It's forever stuff, you know, forever life where we are loved in our forever home. You know, even when, even when we're nothing more than dried up bones, See, even when we're dead, you know, even when we're, we're so often swept up in whatever's going on in this world, 
We all understand that. We just spent two years being caught up in what's going on in this world, didn't we? And not feeling very alive, did we? You know, we all understand that. And when that happens, when we get caught up in the worldly, sometimes we fail in our calling to be God's holy people, a people set apart for, for, for God's divine purpose. We live more in indifference than in passion, more in a spirit of death than that born in hope. You know, we're moved more by, I think sometimes we're moved more by private ambition than we are by social justice. We dream more of privilege and benefits than of service and sacrifice. We try to speak in God's name without relinquishing our own glories, you know, without nourishing our own souls, without relying wholly on God's grace, when in reality we really should be, you know, crying out, oh God, help us to make room in our hearts for you and, 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 and in our lives for you. Forgive us, revive us from being nothing more than bones and reshape us in your image. You know, nourish us right down to the bone. Um, nourish your church right down to the bone so that we can all experience a victory over physical and spiritual death. You remember the song... What song have you been thinking about all morning? I know somebody in here is thinking of that children's song. Yes, there it is, there it is. Dim bones, dim bones, dim dry bones, right? Yep. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. People of God, beautiful people of God, you sitting here with me this morning, hear the word of the Lord. Hear God's voice in these stories and then reply in your own voice. How will you move through these last days of Lent? Will you recognize that even when you feel hopeless, God offers hope? When you feel dead, God offers life? See, when we, when we offer our sorry, dried up, worthless, bony lives and God breathes life into us, then our faithful answer to that is to be a living, breathing, hands-on, active member of the body of Christ, where the foot bone is connected to the ankle bone, and we are the feet of Christ. And the hand bone is connected to the wrist bone, and we are the hands of Christ. We are living, living, living members of Christ's church. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Yeah. So as the servers and the praise team make their way back up to the front, I remind you that our celebration of Holy Communion is open to you. You know, there's nothing that keeps you away. Christ our Lord extends a full welcome to you. And, and you may come with hearts that love Jesus, hearts that are sorry for mistakes, and hearts ready to love and serve God and others. So simply come with open hearts and open hands to receive the bread and dip into the common cup or, or remain where you're seated. Evelyn's coming around um, uh, with a basket of individual portions that are sealed um, so that we might stay healthy in the best way. Um, God is with each of you and God is with us all. So open your hearts wide. Open them completely to the Spirit of God. And may God's love nurture your wandering spirits every day. And, and may God's light sustain your souls each night. Will you tuck the gently tuck in the crimson on either side of you? You break that every time. You break that every time. You hold that up every time. Okay. okay, thank you. Let us pray. Holy God, this is a season of wilderness. The season we kind of grasp to understand you just a little more. This is the time for us to reach inward to find the self that you see. This is the, the chance for us to gaze outward, caring for the Christ in our midst. We know we failed you. But we also claim the forgiveness that you so generously and graciously offer us. Free us, Lord, so that we may joyfully follow you throughout our lives. The Linton roads are long and, and yet full of gifts. The Linton paths often seem kind of chilly, but they warm with the winds of your spirit. Spirit of God, you are the light that leads us in the hushed nights, and Christ is our companion on the journey in the intense sunlight of day. We remember his time in the wilderness, the struggles, the hunger, the, the peace. And as we seek you, the divine, in our midst on this, our journey, we crave 
the bread of life. On our desert roads, we thirst for the fruit of the vine, the cup of blessings. Through Jesus the Christ's story, we remember the night before his arrest, the night of serenity and solemnity and, and love. Jesus took in his hands bread from the table. He broke it and blessed it. Eat in remembrance of me, he said. And after supper, as the night grew long, Jesus took a cup and filled it with the fruit of the vine, and he blessed it. And he spoke aloud to them, take and drink and always remember me. Holy Spirit, who traveled with Christ in the wilderness and fills us with the hope of God, be present in these elements and speak to us in this season of wilderness, becoming our strength on this journey and filling our lives with love. These things we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you serve one another? is set and you are invited to the feast. Will you come? This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence is my daily bread, your very word, spoken to me, and I am desperate for you. of our journey in a spirit of gratitude we give thanks for this time at your holy meal this time at the table fills us with strength knowing that as we continue on this Lenten journey we will find your peace surrounding us amen I invite you to receive the blessing we are a people 
loved by God and blessed with hope. So may the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the courage of the Spirit strengthen your faith and set you loose to share with others all God's love and hope. Amen. Amen. Yeah.